My journey is my testimony, you guys. Losing my three babies was the most difficult thing that I've ever gone through in my entire life. I mean, when I tell you it was heart-wrenching, heart crushing. Every time I would get my hopes up, I would have another miscarriage. One, two, and then three losses nearly destroyed me. If you have gone through miscarriage and you're feeling completely isolated and lonely and just heartbroken right now during this time, please stay tuned and listen to details of my journey. If you're looking for support while trying to navigate the twists and turns of infertility, you might be inspired by how facts and faith might put you on the path to motherhood. Please join my channel to join my space of grace and hit that notification bell so that you might be notified every time I post a video. If you are new to my channel, you might wonder, who is this girl and why am I listening to her? Well, I do have a very unique vantage point. I was an L&D nurse for a period of time, about five years, and also went on to become a nurse practitioner where I've actually influenced, supported, delivered, helped out, all of these things, nurtured women that have gone through pregnancy loss, infertility, and such. And then becoming a mother and going through infertility and pregnancy loss myself, it was very interesting how I was able to see it from a different set of lens. All of these things together solidified my purpose. And it actually showed me that God intended me to be doing exactly what I'm doing right now, supporting others as I have been supported through this community and God himself. So therefore, it's my life's mission right now to be here and support this community. I've also developed an Instagram page directed towards these topics as well. And you can reach me at the underscore joy journey. With that being said, let's get into today's topic. So guys, miscarriage number one, um, although ended in a blighted ovum, and although short-lived, because um, we were pregnant for six and a half weeks, almost seven weeks with baby number one, it was still quite devastating. Uh, this particular miscarriage um, happened about eight months after we got married, and we had already had some type of um, clues that we would have a difficult um, trial trying to get pregnant being that we had endometriosis. So a doctor had already given us the heads up that our endometriosis was severe enough that we needed to take precautions about um, how long we took to get pregnant per se. At the time we were not married, we're not ready. So it was just a null and void conversation. I mean, what were we, what were we to do at that point? So here we are eight months ready to go. Um, and we were very excited when we got the news that we actually were pregnant. Um, unfortunately, our um, hormone levels, our hormone numbers, HCG, did not double within the 48 hours that we actually um, took the test to, to find out um, that we were indeed pregnant. Um, those numbers did not double. Those are numbers that if, if any of you out there have had a miscarriage, I'm sure you're very well familiar with that number because they will follow those numbers until they go all the way back down if they're not doubling the way they should double. Um, also, we did an ultrasound to verify the pregnancy, which showed that there was a blighted ovum, which is um, a baby that started, an embryo that started to develop a ba baby, but it just couldn't completely develop because it did not have what it needed genetically to develop into a full-blown pregnancy, healthy baby. Um, so the body actually uh, miscarries in order um, to end that pregnancy and it, I mean, it, and it, but you already had hopes about that pregnant pregnancy once you get the positive pregnancy test, right? Like, so it doesn't mean that you don't grieve that pregnancy because it was only six weeks. You've already established a full blown idea of this child. I mean, you've already developed a full blown plan for this child's name, face, you know, you're holding this child in your, in your mind. So it's definitely a grieving process. Um, for even uh, a blighted ovum. Not to mention you have to go to the process of um, clearing the body of the pregnancy. So we ended up having a DNC, had the choice of doing a methotrexate, which is a way that you actually can um, kind of, it, it puts your body into labor. Basically it makes you contract until you actually um, expel the baby on your own. And that option is painful and it could be long and drawn out. It scared the mess out of me when my doctor even presented that to me. I was like, there is no way mentally or physically I can put myself through the agonizing pain of, of labor, so to speak, 
um, contracting, hurting, and delivering that child. So the second option was a DNC, and with that option, the doctor goes in and does some scraping around the uterus and suctions everything out so that you can be sure that your uterus is clear of any debris or um, of any parts that the baby, um, from when the baby started to develop. <clears throat> That in itself is also excruciating because if you think about it, I mean, just the thought of it was, 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 mm, it was just hurtful to even go through that part as well. But of the two options, that's what we chose. We got a DNC um, and then we just, we, you know, after the DNC, we were able to start healing. It was hard to heal until we had the DNC. It was very hard to press the restart button. And um, emotionally, we both were just kind of in a, it's, it, it, it's hard to describe what it feels like. Um, but we, it, it took a minute for us to just move forward and say, okay, let's try again. I mean, it, during that time, we were like, well, maybe we can do some work on us as a married couple. We can do some work financially to always improve financially. We can, you know, we can do whatever we can do to, to get in a better position to receive the, that gift um, that God was going to give us next. So um, after about eight months of trying, being that I was already 33 years old, we decided to go ahead and get some more testing done. So at that point, um, the nurse, pre the um, OBGYN that I was seeing, who actually became a good friend of mine, um, she agreed that it might be time to go ahead and do some more testing. <clears throat> We did an HSG, which a histro, which is a hysterosalpinogram, to check to see if the tubes were patent. Because um, when I was first diagnosed with endometriosis back in 2007 or six, um, 2005, actually. Um, let me make sure that's right. Yeah, 25, 2005. Um, we did find out that one of the tubes were was semi-blocked. Like there was some blockage in one of the tubes, which we never really did anything about at the time. So we did the HSG to make sure that that wasn't an issue with both tubes or to see if it was still an issue with one tube. The HSG was actually very successful. There was no blockage there. So that was not, we didn't have a mechanical issue um, to be concerned about. But the testing of my hormone levels, the FSH, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with, the follicular stimulating hormone, which tells us um, how, how many follicles are being produced. Um, and then the um, AMH, which tells us how healthy those eggs are, you know, have the potential to be. Those tests are very indicative of your reproductive health. And so at least that's what was relayed to me at the time. So I put everything on those tests. I really did. I mean, when I found out that my numbers were 30 for my FSH, nearly 30, and below 0 0.01 for my AMH, that number should be two. Um, I, I put everything on that. I mean, it broke me down because that gave me the diagnosis of low ovarian reserve, potentially going into premature ovarian failure, premenopause, however you want to label that. Um, so, and at the time, you know, um, I, I was very medical oriented. It took me, it took a, this journey to actually send me into a different form of thinking, a different mindset. But at that point in time, I was very medically driven. So what the doctors were telling me, what the numbers were showing me, um, you know, I had faith, but it needed to be strengthened. So I put so much weight on those numbers and numbers, y'all numbers during the infertility journey drove me crazy until I had to stop thinking about and feeding so much into the numbers. Um, so at that point, after we got the numbers, realized that we were in premature ovarian failure, um, we decided to go forth with an IVF cycle. Even though they told us that the chances of getting pregnant through IVF were five to 10%, we decided to go ahead and try anyways. And so we, we did that and it failed. <laughs> we only had um, one embryo that could go forward. And the day before we were supposed to get that embryo implanted, it actually did not uh, mature as it was supposed to. So we lost that, even that one embryo. And after that, um, uh, the, the, 
prognosis that we were given was that our chances of getting pregnant on our own was about 1%. And, um, you know, again, you guys, I don't even have to keep repeating that. It was hurtful. It was devastating. It was crushing to every part of you. It's, you know, crushing mentally, crushing to your ego, crushing spiritually, all of that. Um, so... Oddly enough, though, after the IVF cycle, we ended up getting pregnant on our own about one to two months after the IVF cycle. So I should tell you that my miscarriages actually worsened as they went on. Um, the first mis miscarriage that I that we had, you know, it was it was rough, but it progressively in my story gets worse. Um, so this time that we got pregnant um, after one to two months after we had the failed IVF treatment. Um, we got pregnant and we were again, we went on that roller coaster again, so excited, so grateful, so thankful, still didn't tell anybody because we were still very, very cautious um, of this pregnancy as well. But um, the first visit that we went to was good. We saw the baby in the right place. There was a flicker of a heartbeat. The um, HSG numbers were good, but they weren't great. And I should say, excuse me, HCG numbers were good, but they were not great. They um, were high, but they weren't quite as high as they're normally seen for that stage of the pregnancy. But we were... Um, reassured by the fact that we had a baby that was in the right place, we had a flicker for the heartbeat, and it was measuring the way that it was supposed to be measuring. Um, unfortunately, when we went back for the second um, HCG, the numbers had gone up quite a bit, but not had not all the way doubled. But I had heard stories of pregnancies that turned out just fine that did not do what they were supposed to do in the beginning, that didn't completely double. Like maybe they went up, um, you know, 40% instead of, you know, um, doubling or 50% instead of doubling. But, you know, we were still um, cautious being that those numbers did not completely double. Well, it turned out that I ended up having to be followed via ultrasound and HSGs every two days for about a week and a half. And unfortunately, those numbers did not follow the pattern that they were supposed to, to, to follow. And we knew that the pregnancy would not be a good pregnancy. But the, the hard, hard, hard part about this is that we continue to have a heartbeat. So the dilemma that we faced was, do we end a pregnancy that still has a heartbeat? I mean, what do we do? You know, we know that this pregnancy is not going to be a good pregnancy. The heart, the flicker of the heartbeat is getting slower and weaker. The numbers are not going up. What do we do? This was spiritually hard for me because I felt like if I were to, if we were to go ahead and, and have a DNC too early, that it would almost be like, you know, killing the chances of this pregnancy and killing the chances of this child. So we decided to do kind of a wait and watch and we just continued to follow and follow and follow and follow until there was no more flicker. But you guys, this took a couple of weeks, two to three weeks before um, there was no heartbeat. So it, this process of grieving left me kind of at a stalemate, like in a twilight zone. And I'm now I'm carrying a baby that will not make it, but that I'm bonding with at the same time. Y'all, it was, it was, it was, it was unbelievably hard. It was unbelievably hard. So, um, we finally, um, were able to say goodbye to our, our baby, you know, as that heart beat stopped, we did go forth with a second DNC. Um, and once again, once we got the DNC, I feel like we were able to kind of start the healing process again. But y'all, after the second miscarriage, it really, really sent us on an emotional whirlwind. Um, we needed counseling. You know, we needed some grief therapy. 
we joined a couples um, therapy session from our church. So we, you know, joined some other couples to kind of just enjoy life and try to, you know, um, focus on some other things other than, you know, what our personal struggles were at the time. And that was so healing because we got a chance to actually tell our story to people that we have not, we had not even told our family at this point. Um, and we were able to tell these people that we had developed a family with in, a, in the town that we had lived in um, and were able to release and gather some support from them. That was my first time really speaking out about it. Um, and I was urged to do that from, from my counseling sessions and some counseling sessions I did by myself and a couple we did together, um, in order to deal with things separately. Um, at that point, you know, at some point during that journey, I started to think about adoption and donor eggs and those types of things. My husband was nowhere near there. So it caused a rift and we had to pray and we had to, um, we had to work through that. <laughs> we, we did. But at the end of the day, we finally got to the point of, okay, Joyce, rest, rest, rest in what God has for you. Rest in this. Stop trying to control it. Stop trying to come up with plans A, B, and C. Rest, let God do his work. So I finally just stopped. Um, I stopped worrying about it, but I still continue doing things for myself to, to, um, get my body in a better position for when God did, um, present us with another child. So pressed on, got pregnant again, um, on our own. So after we were given the diagnosis with low ovarian reserve and that our chances were 1% to get pregnant, y'all, we got pregnant one, two, three, four times after this diagnosis. So that's two more miscarriages and then two more babies that I actually have. So that's why I tell you, do not feed into what those doctors are telling you. Do not feed into the numbers, guys. You have to look at the bigger story. And although your story may not be like mine, I pray to God, you don't have three miscarriages. Um, but, in, but some people have more, some people have less, but know that you will get to your baby. You will. So third miscarriage, um, was the most painful thing that I've ever been through in my entire life, entire life personally, um, that I've been through. Um, we got pregnant, we kept it secret. We did not tell anybody till the second trimester, but in the second trimester, we did everything. We were, we let down our guards. We made gifts for our families. We drove to our hometown. We presented our families with those gifts. We made a big deal out of it. Um, we prepared things, we bought things, we, we were getting the crib, all of the things, guys, all of the things. And, um, the, on Valentine's day, um, my husband had a very personal, just me and him surprise, um, gender reveal, which, I had no idea it was going down, but he took me to a very nice restaurant that we love. I got all dressed up, felt pretty, felt beautiful, um, felt so pregnant. You guys, at this point, I was um, 16 and a half weeks pregnant. Um, we found out we were having a girl, beautiful baby girl. All of my hopes for that baby girl started to flood in. And that night after we found out that we were having a baby girl is when, you know, I got my Pinterest board up. I started to have, I, you know, I think it was called all girl everything or something. And, you know, I, I was restless that night because I was just so excited, like so full of joy. And then I got up that morning and I was a little bit cramp crampy. TMI felt a little constipated. So I thought the crampiness was coming from that. I felt a little bit heavy in my lower segment of my uterus, but I thought it was more so constipation. Nowhere in my mind was I thinking anything other than that. Cause at this point I'm thinking we've made it. We're good. You know, this is golden. And so I went to work, um, in the, in that time I was doing house call visits in the field, went to work and went to bend down to, to pick up something. I think it was something to, to check, you know, the patient's feet or something like that. 
and felt just a lot of pressure there. And I'm, I kind of grimaced and my patient was like, that's not normal. Cause she knew I was pregnant. She said, that's not normal. You need to go check and see what's going on there. You know, you shouldn't be feeling pain or pressure at this point. So I left her home on the way to the next patient's house. I stopped to, to use the restroom at a public area, went into the restroom. And at that point, um, I felt pressure into my vagina and I felt down there and I felt slippery, firm, something. And I thought it was the baby's head. I flipped out, you guys. I flipped out. Um, I went into the store, I came out of the restroom, went into the store and all, I just kept yelling, I'm losing my baby, I'm losing my baby. I just remember yelling that. And like three or four people rushed over to surround me and I just fell to the floor. And the doctor part of me was like, put your feet up, put your feet up, don't let the baby come out. So I sat on the floor. I think y'all, there were like, I was in a in the aisle where there were like the pins and pads or something like that. And I just started stuffing them underneath my bottom to like lift my bottom up off the floor so that the baby would not come out. Like I'm completely playing nurse to myself at this point. In the meantime, I'm flipping out, crying hysterically. Um, they call the ambulance. The ambulance gets there. My blood pressure is like almost 200 over a hundred y'all. And I had a low blood pressure and it was like 200 over a hundred. They thought I was going to have like a stroke or something, but they, you know, tried to calm me down. Um, got me to the hospital, called my husband. Um, he got to the hospital where I was. Um, and at that point they did confirm that my cervix had completely open. Like my cervix was like a five centimeters dilated. Um, and the baby was so far down in the pelvis that, that, you know, sometimes they can do something called an emergency surclage where they can push the baby back up, close off the cervix, and you can continue for some time like that. But y'all, the baby was so far down um, that they could not do that. So they had me in Trendelenburg, which is a position where your head is laying flatter than your body. Um, and just, just preserve what was there, you know, preserve what they could. Uh, put me in a room, my OBGYN at that point, um, you know, was there to take care of me. And the hardest part about this journey, y'all, was the whole time, the whole time, Gabriella was moving and fighting. Every ultrasound they would do, we would see her kicking and moving and fighting and vibrant. She was fine. Her heart was strong, never dropped. Healthy, perfectly healthy, sweet little baby girl in there. And the only thing that was keeping me from meeting her months later was this cervix that was that had opened prematurely. So at that point, of course, I was diagnosed with incompetent cervix. I had to actually, um, two days I was in the hospital with antibiotics, seeing if basically she would, if the pregnancy would kind of protrude up far enough for them to do an emergency surclage that never happened. Um, so we had to deliver her and I had to go through a full blown delivery. You guys, I had an epidural that failed did not work. And so I felt everything. I felt the, um, oh. I felt the, um, the numbing that they were trying to do. I felt when I delivered the baby and what was more excruciating as far as pain, physical pain was them trying to get the, um, the placenta out that did not want to come out. I mean, literally it had to be manually taken out, um, with an epidural that was not working. So y'all, there was so much spiritual, physical, and emotional pain that was going on. It was unbelievable, but we delivered her. And when we delivered her and my husband was not ready for this, she was still having breath, breathing motions. And so every now and then she, she would breathe and even though we knew she wasn't far along to live outside the body she had breaths 
for some time before it stopped. And we held her, held her to ourselves. My husband held her, I held her on my bare chest. And we held her until she stopped taking breaths and um, the nurses came in, they took pictures of her. We've got beautiful pictures of her, beautiful pictures of her. And I'll never forget her hands, her little hands that could fit in mine, her little two feet that could fit in the palm of my hand. She was perfect, guys. She was perfect. Um, and because of her, I'll never be the same. We had Olivia picked out as a name, but when she was born, my husband knew that she was Gabriella. And Gabriella is the angel of hope. Gab Gabriel from the Bible is the, is the angel of hope. So we named her after Gabriel as the angel of hope because that's what she brought us. She brought us hope. She brought us reassurance. And she brought us eventually comfort, even though so much pain came out of it and so much healing time came out of it. And it took a while to get to, to be healed. Um, but we called her Hope because that's what she was. We had a dedication ceremony for her. We had her little body um, cremated and we have her remains. We have a memorial for her in my, my baby's closets. And we remember her and we, we talk about her and my children will know her. So I say all of these things to say that um, miscarriage is painful on so many levels. But guys, you're not alone. You are not alone. I feel your pain. And in the video to come, I'm actually going to talk about how it does change you forever. And surprisingly, there are some good things that can come out of miscarriage. But that's my journey. I really appreciate you listening. Um, I really appreciate your support. Um, and I really hope you got something out of this. I really hope you got something out of me just talking to you about how our experience was. Remember guys that expressing your feelings are part of the healing process. And if you have trouble right now, if you're in the middle of that grieving process and you're not able to see the light or you're, you know, you're not turning around, or if your spouse is concerned about your progress in the journey, please, please reach out to a specialist, reach out to a therapist, reach out to a pastor or someone that you can um, share this with that can help you through the grief that can help you with tools um, that you will utilize along your journey to cope with the process. This video was in honor of not only the babies that I've lost, but also honoring those other women that have also lost children. And also this video is in honor of pregnancy loss and miscarriage awareness month. I really appreciate you watching. If you don't mind, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button and I'll see you in the next one. Have a blessed day.